You're listening to another life-transforming message from C3 Church San Diego. For more information on our church, go to c3sandiego.com. I want to, I want to talk about uh, healing, healing from the wounds of our family of origin. And one of the reasons I want to talk about that area is because we do, we help people with marriages and whatever, and everyone starts out really great. They all really start out really great, but somewhere down the journey, things seem to go wrong. And what happens is the things that have been uh, unresolved in the background have a way of all finding their way to the surface again, like rocks just coming up out of the soil. And then there are difficulties and challenges take place in life. So if you're married, this will explain some things. If you're not married, then these are the things you need to be aware of before you get married. And I can tell you now, if the guy you're going to marry won't open his heart to let God in to bring healing, then he'll bring all his baggage with him. And you will discover it. You will find it. And uh, then it's often far more difficult to deal with. So we need to recognize that we bring with us whatever it is we've got unresolved and particularly the issues that are so important are the issues from the family of origin things from that area of our life will always produce a fruit so we're now you know being married this next year we'll be celebrating 50 years married so we must have got something right and uh, we do and we've got seven children and 24 grandchildren and everyone goes to church and everyone's in the Lord and we're we're very thankful for that so we must have done one or two things right on the way and uh, the day I got married, uh, we had a very challenging coming together. Uh, I come from a Catholic background and Catholic schools and so on. And Joy came from uh, what you call like a Southern Baptist, a Brethren background. And so we, we, I, she was just opposite me in the, in the chemistry class. It was oh, a girl. Oh. <laughs> I was just too nerdy for words then. Not much different now, but anyway. <clears throat> and, and, and so we, we really drew together God. I, it, it, ultimately, God was bringing our lives together, but there were these challenges from the families of origin, and uh, each family had their own perspective about this, and in those days, there was very little tolerance, so we were caught in a drama, and uh, it was a very difficult drama. It played out over a period of time, and uh, I was caught you know, on and off with her in a relationship for about seven years, and it was really quite heartbreaking, and uh, it deeply impacted both of us, uh, the consequence was that uh, we had a child out of wedlock. And in those days, the shame around it was so very, very deep that we just uh, concealed the pregnancy and adopted the little child out, little girl. And, and so our, when we eventually were able to solve the problem of coming together, we uh, both came into the marriage with a broken heart. And so even though we loved each other, there was damage to the heart and I'm going to talk about this tonight and share with you just some insight around the heart so you can understand why these things are so impacting and uh, within a, a two years I'd had uh, the day I got married I, I asked the Lord into my life asked him into our marriage to make a threefold cord about two years later I had an encounter with the Holy Ghost and then next thing you know we're full on in the Holy Ghost we're in church and we're, we're into it I'm into a move of God didn't even know what it was and uh, seeing people getting delivered and see things happening and and uh, but deep at the core of our marriage there were some blocks in the heart that affected us and we would have pastors come in and we'd tell them and it was like we told them and it's like they never heard a word and we would wonder why it is they would never pray for us or do anything. And we come to figure in the end, they didn't have any answers. They just had theology. And so we pursued and hungered for the Holy Ghost. We shifted up to where we currently based in Hastings. And we, I, I felt then somehow I have to resolve issues of my heart. We've got to find a way through this. And uh, we began to seek God for transformation internally. And the Lord led us into an encounter experience where we start to understand why we were struggling the way we were and what the invisible barriers were that we had no idea, that no marriage course could fix. So often people go to marriage courses and they get to learn skills and things you can do, and they're all wonderful. But if the heart doesn't get changed, those things won't last. And I'll talk to you about why that is in a moment. And so the Lord worked an amazing work in our life. And then we began to get a deliverance move in the church. Man, it was wild. It was the wildest thing I've ever seen. People tried to stop it happening. I had pastors ring me up, complain. I said, no, no, I'm having so much fun. I've never had so much fun in my life. This is the real deal. You're not taking this away from me. I said, I don't, you, you take your theology somewhere else. I, I know what God is doing. And, 
And then within uh, about two years of us being there, um, the laws all changed and we had the opportunity to make connection with the daughter we'd lost. And I've been praying for her for 18 years. And in her 18th year, we wrote a letter in. A letter came in at the same time from the family. And then we started a connection with her. And God has restored her back into our lives. I had the chance uh, eventually of... Uh, taking a wedding for her and marrying her had the opportunity to lead her and her husband to the Lord to pray for them to have a pregnancy and then we took them on a mission trip and now they've come to work with us and build with us and they're our staunch supporters how about that eh? that's God but all, all through it we've had to address the issues of the heart and so there's, there's a lot could be taught around this. It's usually not taught about very much. I'm going to give you a, 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 just enough for you to understand the importance of the heart and then what to do about your journey of the heart. Because everyone can choose to take the heart journey and let God change them, or you can resist the heart journey. And when you resist the heart journey, you'll just try to live your Christian life on the outside there will be a lack of authenticity in some parts of it, and there will be a lack of intimacy in your relationships. So let me just uh, just start to share with you from Scripture. We'll just start off with uh, Proverbs uh, 4.23, Proverbs 4.23. And uh, in Proverbs, there are many wonderful Scriptures there. But this one here says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of your heart flow the issues of your life. In other words, guard your heart. Or protect your heart for whatever your heart is or whatever it's referring to he says out of your heart flow the issues of your life and the original language means the borders the limitations uh, the boundaries of the life you live are not determined by your background they're not determined by your education they're not determined by your finance not determined by anything except by what is in your heart and the beliefs that you have in your heart Will, will literally direct the way your life runs. It'll also affect who gets attracted into your life. And so it's important that we let God have access to our heart. And uh, what is the heart? When God created us, He created us to be in His image in the earth. And so He's created you and I a spirit being. So at the core of us, we're a spirit being. With spirit for, uh, faculties, we can connect with the spiritual dimension of God. And we have the ability to have access to God and connect to Him. We've also, we live within a body so we can express through physical senses into the physical world. We're absolutely unique, a masterpiece designed to live in two dimensions, heaven and earth. To be able to live in the presence of God, carry the presence of God and reflect what he's like into the earth. And all of that must flow through something. It flows through the soul, the mind, will, and emotions. So where's the heart? And some people think the heart refers to all of the inner man. My searching about it, my opinion is that the heart is, uh, is the core of your being. It's the junction between your spirit and soul. So it's your heart that's very important to you. It's the heart. It, it, just think about this. When God wanted to change you, he puts his spirit and joins it to your spirit so you have power. And then he softens your heart so you have a heart towards him. So your heart is incredibly important. Your heart is the core of who you are. Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. So your heart is who, where your identity is. Your heart is where your believing is. It says, with the heart man believes unto salvation. So w there's so many scriptures of different kinds that talk then about the heart and the, the different kinds of heart. Your heart can be hard. Your heart can be disconnected. You can live a life disconnected from your heart. If you've been hurt too much and you decide to bury the pain and never resolve it, then what happens is you disconnect your head from your heart and you live out of your head and reasoning and you can never form heartfelt, heart-connected relationships. Your heart is really important. The Bible says the love of God flows out of our heart by the Holy Ghost. So if we were to think, now I want you to just think about this. In, in the area of sexual intimacy, the world portrays it as being something physical. But actually God's design is that out of our heart, out of our innermost being, would flow the love of God as a river of blessing so that sexual union would be physical and it would be to do with the soul and also the flow of the Spirit of God. So it would carry something that brings a deep, deep connectedness and fulfillment. Do you understand then that if the heart is damaged, 
The capacity to flow intimately is limited. The capacity to relate intimately. Every part of your heart that's fractured and damaged, you will keep it out of relationship. And the more it's kept out of relationship, the more lonely you get. So, so the heart is just so important to our journey. And uh, here's another reason the heart is uh, very important to our journey. If we read in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7, and, uh, and God is about to choose a king. And so he sends Samuel down to Jesse's house. He said, go, I've got a king there, go find him. So the first man out off the block is the eldest, Eliab, which is very tall, good looking guy. And he looks at him and thinks, that's gotta be a king. That, that's a king. That one is a looker, he's a good one. And, uh, and notice what God has to say. He says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at the appearance of his physical stature. I, the Lord, have refused him. That word refuse means to totally reject him. So what, what God's saying is, when you look through the natural eyes at what people look like, you'll never see the real person. If everything you're concerned about is how beautiful you look, how amazing you look, and all your externals, and you don't address the heart, people never meet the real you. They can't meet the real you. He says, because for the Lord sees not as man sees, for man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So one by one, they brought all of these sons out. Everyone looked a winner. And God said about everyone, they're not the one I want. And when there's no more left, he said, well, that's it. Is there anyone else? He said, no, we're well, just a young fellow out there, but his, his, his origins, uh, we, you know, we're ashamed of him. So he's just out in the field. God, and, and Samuel said, bring him in. And the moment they brought him in, God said, that's my man. He said, for I have sought me, Acts, 20, uh, Acts uh, 14, 22, I have sought me a man after my heart. I have sought for someone who has a desire to know my heart. So God has a heart too. To know my heart and who will fulfill my will in their generation. This is the guy. And everyone's shocked because he was not the one you would choose. And in that whole story is something that God doesn't look like we look. So, so I've had to ask the Lord to help me to see people the way He sees them, to not see them according to whether they're black or white, male or female, tall or short or whatever, but to see the person, the hidden man of the heart, and to relate to people as God would see them. So, so God doesn't look on the external. Now, you know, when, when religion tries to change us, it tries to change what you look like, how you speak, how you behave. It tries to control your exterior and never can produce deep internal change. It produces a religious spirit of control over your life. When God wants to change us, His interest is always in your heart. So His method of changing our life always, He's never worried about the externals, never. Because if He can catch your heart, He's got you. And if He's got you in your heart, then eventually you will change on the outside. So if you don't catch the heart, you'll always be caught trying to change things that will never really change a person. Okay? So, so when God changes us, He empowers our spirit and brings it into life. So there's an energy source in us. And then He softens our heart. So we'll begin to start to grow in knowing Him and loving Him. So our journey for every one of us is what you call the journey of the heart, getting to know God intimately from our heart. And as we get to know Him intimately from the heart, He reveals the places and parts that are damaged His heart is to heal it. So that brings us to Jesus' ministry. Now I'll get on to some practical things in a moment. But Jesus stood up and He said, Here, I'm going to announce to you my assignment. Jesus came with an assignment from the Father. And so He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me. He said, We'll love the anointing. What's the anointing for? The anointing is to fulfill an assignment. Now, when you read Jesus' assignment, you catch the heart of God to you. And you also catch His order of priorities. He said, this is the first thing, send me to preach the gospel to the poor. Most people just see it only at the level of someone making a decision to receive Christ, get saved. There's more to it than that. You could reword it like this and say, my Father has sent me to proclaim how you can become reconnected to your Father in heaven and become a son, a daughter of the living God in relationship with Him. But because he's so longing for relationship, he wants to engage your heart and heal the places of brokenness. So what does it mean to have a broken heart? 
because the places of broken heart, the places of sin are the places demons come in and imprison us and torment us and steal from us the ability to have relationships. They cause cycles in a family that just keep repeating generation after generation. You may run after or run away from home, but home doesn't run away from you. It's still inside you. So when you enter a relationship, you'll bring in what you never solved. So we need to let God have access to our heart. Jesus' ministry was focused on the heart. God's focus is on your heart. No matter what you look like, no matter how gifted you are, He can take an ordinary, less gifted person, and if their heart is right, raise them up, put honor on them, and bring them to a place where they have stature. So God wants, wants to engage you in your heart because He wants intimacy with you. Intimacy means that He sees into you and you are making known who you really are. Intimacy means you are starting to discover Him and knowing how deeply He loves you. But if your heart is blocked, then there are blocks to that intimacy and there are blocks to carrying the presence of God. So to be a carrier of revival, you need to let God work in your heart and to bring healing around your life. Otherwise, you can't carry the life. You're always in conflict. So Jesus said He came to heal the brokenhearted. So what does it mean to have a broken heart? What is that about? And then we're going to look at some of the causes of it, and I'll show you the journey forward. So we can have a prayer time tonight, an encounter time tonight. God can set you free and touch you in many deep ways. But it's not a one-off. It's a journey you take of deepening intimacy with God and vulnerability to Him and knowing Him and being able to really enjoy Him. And out of that, you can bring His life to others. Amen? You become a carrier, not just an information machine. See, think about this. Anyone can go on Google and find everything they want. But the one thing you can't find out is an intimate experience with God. You've got to have it. You've got to encounter Him. You've got to experience Him. See? Okay, so broken heart. The word of broken heart in the New Testament, the word means to be shattered, to be broken into pieces. Or in other words, fragmented and separated. Uh, it, it's a picture of having experiences where you got hurt and you know what to do with it, so you kept it apart so you didn't have to connect to it. And then there's another experience you've had that really hurt you and you didn't want to connect to that either, so you kept that apart as well. Until after a while in your life, you've got a lot of you is just fragmented and you don't want to know and connect with any of it because it hurts too much. And when someone says or does something that reminds you of that, all the anger and pain comes up and you start to react or avoid it. See? Broken heart. The, the word broken heart also has a picture of this. It's like if you were to walk over a piece of ground and just keep walking over it and tramping it under, you'd form a rut in it. That's the picture also of a broken heart. Someone who's been walked over by people so frequently, it's shaped the way they do life. Uh, in the Old Testament, it has a similar kind of meaning. In Psalm 147, verse 3, it says, God heals the brokenhearted. There it is again, shattered, burst, broken, in fragments. And it says, He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up all their wounds. And the word wound is a word meaning an idol, a source of sorrow. So the places where you are hurt in your life, you will try to stop yourself being hurt again, and without realizing it, you'll yield to fear and try and control your relationship so you don't get hurt again. So the more places in your heart that you have been hurt, the more fear will govern the way you do life, and the more you try to control people and relationships. So that the difficulty is we come into relationships not realizing how damaged some people are and how much of their life is fear of being hurt again. And now, yeah, they're smiling. Yeah, they're giving you, but it's only so far because really, I'm not sure I, I'm safe with you. And that's what Jesus came to set us free from. When we hurt, we have the choice. At the moment you're hurt, you can turn towards God, surrender it to Him, and yield to His Spirit, and He'll bring healing. You're bl forgiven, blessed. You move on empowered, and you become larger. Or you can keep it to yourself, try to survive the pain, hold the pain in, and then fear comes around, and now you start to control life and relationships. And so many people live under strong control spirits that hinder them entering into deep relationships because they wouldn't let God have access to the pain or didn't know how. 
See, so we need, to, we need to try to work through those and help to deal with that. Let me give you a few sources of, of our, our family pain, and they can come in a whole different number of ways. Uh, one is just generational stuff. Many families, they've got issues in the family that have been in the family lines, what you call a generational cursing. The cursing is just a cycle of failure that keeps repeating over and over, generation after generation. And uh, we, we've had to pray for many, many people. I've had to pray to deal with cursings in our own family background that produce cycles of immorality and financial hardship. And once they were broken, it changed. We've been able to break the cycle and change the pattern for the future generation. So a generational curse is initiated when someone violates the law of God or things are initiated. It can be by involvement with spiritism. It can be involvement with sexual perversion, involvement with uh, incest, involvement with uh, injustice to the poor. Those things can trigger off demonic spirits into the people's lives that then travel down through the family. And many times the things we're struggling with are the battles our family ancestors never won but you are the generation God is raising up to end that battle and do something different. Huh? Amen? Okay, so a second source is parents uh, with all their best wishes come in, they carry in good, they carry in their brokenness, and so often their hurts and, and damage caused in families. And it's frequently, uh, it's just the things that happen. Uh, sometimes they're far more severe than others, but there can be tremendous things happen in a family that bring deep wounding. And if the culture of the family is not to engage, talk, and bring healing, then all the stuff goes underground. So the generation I came up and do, no one talked about anything. So like, they didn't even talk the fact we could get away with having a pregnancy and hiding it. How do you do that? You know, it's just like, that's the culture. No one talked. No one talk. Now, people talk more now, but they don't always know how to deal with the issues that come up. So, so frequently the problem are things that have happened in the family background. I was just talking to a pastor the other day. I said, now tell me about your family. And he said, oh, my father uh, was an alcoholic. He, uh, he, 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 he abandoned the family. And I said, oh, that's sad. I said, where do you fit in the family? And he said, well, I'm the oldest one there. And I said, let me talk to you then what your life has taken. I said, because when a child is left in a family and the father's abandoned the family, they will arise and they take on the dad's responsibility. And then they own a responsibility that was never theirs. And then they suffer grief because their childhood is stolen. They carry weights of burdens that they should never carry. They become resentful at having done that. And then when they enter into life and get involved in wherever they're involved in, they take on the roles of others which they should never have taken on. And they become a rescuer of people. It's called burden bearing. There's another name for it away. But at the end, the impact of the brokenness of one family member has left the other members in all kinds of fear and anxiety about relationships. So there's many ways that we can be hurt within the families. That was one of them. I had another one just the other day, and it was just interesting, really. And uh, the person's mother had a terrible miscarriage. And uh, after she had the miscarriage, she got pregnant again. But when the next pregnancy came, she was afraid of connecting to this child in case she would lose her. So she closed her heart up not to feel or connect to the child. She didn't want to run the risk of having a disappointment again. And the result was the child experienced deep rejection in the womb when she was born, hated the mother already, and was in conflict with the mother all her life until she realized that is what happened. I caught something and my heart was broken from the beginning. So there's so many things like that, and solutions are not very hard, as long as you go to where to look and know what happens. So people carry into their life many, many different griefs and sorrows from the home. They can be uh, things in the womb, as I mentioned, of being rejected or not wanted. I had one pastor's wife I prayed for, and she, uh, her father wanted boys, didn't want any girls, hated, girl, hated a woman. And, and, he, and when she realized at an early age, I'm not acceptable as I am, she made a vow in her heart, I'll never be vulnerable, I'll never cry, I'll never ever show weakness, I'll beat the boys. And so she became very, very com uh, competitive. And years later, when I met the couple, I, I ministered to him, he had a massive freedom. And then he, I, I said to her, I'd like to come to your home to talk with you and pray for you. And I said to the woman, this is what I said to her, I said, this is what I feel in my spirit when I'm with you. 
You are an invisible woman. You're there, but you're not there. The real you is hidden a long time ago. I'd like to know why you had to hide. And then she told me, and the husband was shocked, had no idea. When she got set free, suddenly she began to feel again. She began, her heart began to respond again. She could feel emotions again. A whole gifting began to emerge again. Just amazing, just simple, just understanding that when the heart is wounded, if it doesn't find healing in the Lord, we will try to control and manage the pain we have. And so things can happen in the womb. They can happen uh, at birth and wrong sex. The child is the one they don't want. Uh, it can happen because there's traumas in the birth. It can happen there's traumas in the, in the pregnancy. All of these things all carry on uh, in the family background. If the, one of the parents is a violent parent, then, every, then the children all are left afraid and insecure. Their heart is damaged and they carry it all through their life until it's healed. There's verbal abuse, sexual abuse, and those kind of abuses in the family. The heart is shattered, trust is shattered, and the ability to form trust is very deeply impacted. In a situation where a child is prematurely born and put in an incubator, uh, the first bonding is, uh, is, is uh, uh, not does not occur properly. Instead of there being a proper bonding and adjoining, there's a separation, then usually that child will start, struggle with trust issues all their life. So you see, these are the issues of the heart. And people can look great on the outside, but inside they're suffering deep grief, deep pain. And so people emerge into their life journey with a broken heart and patterns they've learned in their family of coping that then reproduce in the next generation. So in order for us to shift things, we've got to, we've got to be intentional about pursuing transformation. You say amen to that? So there's a whole lot of things. The divorce of parents can cause this problem or uh, remarriage. And then there's a unfair or the, the problems between the two parents. There's so many different kinds of ways kids get hurt growing up. Just even being compared with others, being bullied, all that kind of thing. I know my younger brother suffered because he was always compared with me. And he was unfavorably compared with me. I was the academic one, worked hard. And so he was always compared unfavorably and it produced a deep wounding in him. What he didn't realize, I was deep wounded by rejection, was working to try and get approval. It's like both of us were broken and both trying to cope in a different way. Me by working, trying to get the approval and him by contending and, and getting into arguments to try and, try and deal with the pain of being rejected. So I got lots of stories of all kinds of people that we've interacted with and we've had to deal with our own. In Joy's situation, she had a, uh, a separation from her mother very young because of, a, uh, of an accident and she was in hospital for months. So she had a trauma of separation that impacted her at the very early stages of her life and then caused the heart to close up because of what had happened. And then you don't open up, you can't, you're in bondage. She had a sister next to her in a car crash who died uh, uh, tragically next to her when she was aged 11. It affected her for years. No one spoke about it. It was like there's been a loss, but no one's talking. There's no healing, no, no engagement to deal with the heart. The heart is left to just carry the trauma alone. So there are many, this is the story of so many people. If you will have a heart to listen, people will tell you their story. Everyone's got a story. And if you listen, you know, the interesting, when God came to find Adam, his first statement to Adam was first, it was a question, Adam, where are you? If you think that's what God does, hey, where are you? And, and if you would start to learn to relate to people that way, hey, I just want to meet you and find where you are. Tell me your journey. Tell me your story. Let me know where you are. And then he asked, well, then who are you listening to? What voices? What's influencing you? Because when people are hurt and wounded, demons talk to them, and they have demonic voices, and they think they're just me because they've lived that way all their life. And Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. And we tend to forget that in Jesus' day, the generation that he ministered to, there were mothers there who'd had their children slaughtered, a generation of children slaughtered. The trauma must have been enormous. They were living under Roman oppression. The abuse must have been enormous. He came to heal the brokenhearted. 
Interesting, when God brought the people out of, is, out of Israel, out of Egypt, he brought them out of Egypt, and you know, all the miracles and all the things they did, and they came out and they danced in the desert. And then the very first thing he wanted to do was this. He brought them in Exodus 15 to the waters of Marah, meaning bitter. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to show them that even though they were set free physically, even though they had a new beginning, even though they were on a journey to a promised land, that they would never enter all he had unless their heart was healed. And so he brought them to show them that they carried years of bitterness, of slavery, of abuse, of the loss of children, of, of abortions, of miscarriages, of rape, abuse, all kinds of things. He said he brought them to the borders of bitterness that they might see and discover for themselves that they were bitter and needed healing. And he said, I'm the Lord who heals. I heal the broken heart too. So he knew that they could never receive everything he'd planned if their hearts remained broken because they would never develop faith necessary to take hold of the promises. Whenever there was a conflict, they'd always think, ah, nah, no, nah, you know, I can't do this. A victim mindset. When they came out of Egypt, they were free physically, but their mentality and their heart was that of an orphan. It was that of a victim. I have no power. It's not fair what life does to us. And this is the condition of so many people today. It's a heart condition. It has to do with beliefs in the heart and wounds in the heart. And if we don't resolve them, we carry them into our relationships, carry them into our lives. So God wants to help us with that. There's so many different ways, and who knows what it is that's happened to you that broke your heart. But if your heart was broken, it can be broken so many ways. The heart of God is for you to be free so you can enjoy relationships. Recently, I woke up. And as I was waking up, I had a dream. And in the dream, the Lord spoke to me. And he spoke to me about one of my sons. And he named my son and he said that he is emotionally disconnected in his heart. And it happened in the womb. And I, I was shocked. I woke up. And so I prayed about it for a little while. And then I shared with him. And I said, this is what the Lord showed me, that as a result of the trauma of Joy having to close her heart when she had a child she was not going to have to adopt, that there was an impact left upon you as the next child. It's affected you, and ever, ever since, you've had an emotional disconnection. And, and he, he listened to me, and I said, go away and I pray about it. Let the Lord show you, and you'll be aware that there's a disconnectedness in your life relationally and emotionally. It'll be affecting your marriage and your relationship with your children and every relationship. He came back to me, said, Dad, I see that there's a problem. Will you pray for me? I'd asked him to forgive me. I said, it's not something you did. It's something that you walked into because we had sinned. Will you forgive us? And he was quite surprised by that. And then he, when he came back to me and I was able to pray for him and God touched him and freed his heart. And I can feel the change in him. You understand, whether you did it in mistake or out of brokenness, at the end, our brokenness overflows. It's like if you cut yourself, you'll bleed everywhere. Everyone you touch, you put blood on them. When your heart is broken, somehow we affect everyone. Why is it we affect everyone? Because we put walls in our heart. We wall people out. We make promises that will never let anyone hurt us again. Make promises and vows that will never be hurt again. I had one young lady who come up in a prayer and she would have been 30, she's 35, a Vietnamese girl. And uh, she had been traumatized at the age of 12. So her father was very wealthy, some men broke into the family and they tied her up. That's traumatic, tied her up. They threatened her with a chopper. They're gonna chop her up if dad didn't tell where the money was hidden. And she wouldn't, he wouldn't tell where the money was hidden. So they beat up the dad. They didn't hurt her, but the trauma of it all still was with her. So we prayed for her and she was, uh, she was radically, she just shook from head to foot, radically set free. And as she was turning away, the Lord said, I'm not finished yet. I said, come back, come back, come back. Come back. I said, You've got a problem with men and with money, haven't you? And she said, that's right, how'd you know? She said, I would love to get married, but I've got, uh, there's something I just seem to blow up relationships. She said, I'd love to have, build a legacy, but she said, I've got a highly paid job. I cannot keep money, it just disappears. And I said, I'll tell you why. I said, did you ever make a promise to yourself, I'll never have money because money puts my life in danger? And she said that I did. 
I said, well, you've made vows that have hardened your heart and you've made judgments about money and you've now got a cycle in your life that all the money that comes in, when it comes in, it won't stay with you because you don't honor it and value it. You've actually judged that this puts danger in my life. I need to get rid of it. Now, that's not one person. I pray for more people than that with that same problem. Sharp people, educated people. And money would go away from them because there was an issue in their heart where they'd made judgments about what money does and vows that never allow themselves to be under that impact. I said, you've done the same with men. You've made a vow in your heart that you'll never let a man near to you because of the pain and the terror of what these other men did. You've judged all men to be dangerous. She said, that's right. I said, you need to repent of these things and renounce them and let God set your heart free of the bondage and captivity you've come into. And the next day she turned up, she was transformed. She said, I've got a plan in place. I could not believe that this was what's been holding me back all this time. You see, there's all of these different things. So what are some steps in our heart journey? I believe that all of us, as you walk with the Lord, are on a journey of heart transformation. Why? Because your identity is in your heart, and God's plan is to conform us to become like Jesus. So that's a lifelong journey. And that journey is accelerated when we become more aware of our heart and learn how to be intimate with God, have encounters with God, and let Him bring healing to the parts of our heart. And sometimes we just get so busy we can't slow down enough to explore what's in our heart. Your heart will talk to you if you listen to it. It talks through your emotions. Feelings of anger tell you something's going on in your heart. Feelings of fear tell you something's going on in your heart. Anxiety tells you something's going on in your heart. But what we try and do is we try and bury those or medicate those instead of reading them and discovering what's in our heart and then realigning our heart with God's Word. He said, in the world, they're all anxious. But if you'll put first my kingdom and living right before me, everything in it will come to you. See, Matthew 6, 33. So what are some steps you could do? Well, number one, we need to recognize if there's pain that's unresolved. You may, not, you may recognize some now because of the stories I've shared, but in your journey, as you recognize pain, don't pretend it isn't there. It is there. It can be triggered all kinds of ways. I remember... Uh, I remember I would, I would listen and a certain kind of music would come on and I'd feel tears come. I'd hear someone playing a violin and tears would come. And I thought, now that's weird. I wonder why I've got emotions around that. And I thought, well, it's like a bit of romantic music. So, and anyway, I, so I thought, well, I'll just keep playing that piece until I find out what's underneath it in my heart. And so I would just play this piece over and over and over and over. It was actually a piece on the end of an action movie, but it was just, it took place and, 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 a, and it was, a, I can't even remember the name of the song, but it, but it had this violin music playing and it would affect me. And each time I'd hear it, I'd cry. And I thought, I wonder why I'm crying. So I just sat down, played it, played it, let myself cry. And I said, now God, what is under there? And suddenly I become aware of it. And I was quite shocked. Because you see, There'll be, there'll be things that trigger your heart. And if you keep shutting down what you feel, you'll never listen to your heart. You'll learn to listen to your heart. And suddenly the Lord took me back. And I remember at the most intense time of our romance, when we're in Wellington, I took Joy to a restaurant. And it was a special one, which had a man with a violin would come around and play whatever you wanted at the table. And when I would hear the violin music, it would remind me that my heart was still broken. And I said, God, I'm still hurting. And then I was able to open my heart and let the grief all come out and be healed. So sometimes it can be a sound, it can be a scene, it can be something just triggers an emotion in your heart. Instead of trying to push it aside, you go and ask, what am I feeling and what is driving that? Lord, what is there in my heart I'm unaware of? That's all you got to do. If you're feeling angry, well, I'm feeling angry. What is under there? What am I angry at? What is my heart trying to tell me? I'm feeling tense. Oh, what is my heart trying to tell me? I'm feeling fearful. What's my heart trying to tell me? In other words, instead of cutting off your heart, you learn to engage your heart. 
It's not living out of your emotions. It's using your emotions to explore what your heart, what its perspective is on life. So, so some simple keys. Number one, we need to recognize if there's a part of our life in pain. We have cycles of failure in relationships, blocks, barriers in relationship, inability to experience God, receive love, those kind of things. You need to take responsibility is the second thing. Stop blaming anyone. This is your heart, your journey, your life. It's your job to discover what's in your heart, to guard your heart and then cultivate your heart. It's your job. And so you got to stop blaming. While you blame others, you'll never find out what's going on inside you. You'll be looking in the wrong place. When you blame someone else, you put the responsibility out there. You lose the power to find out what's in your own life that needs changing. And it can be all kinds of things that people are stuck with. Uh, I remember with my son-in-law and uh, we were struggling. He was struggling over holding money. I said, well, what do you, when you think about money, what do you think about? And he said, oh, well, money's evil. I said, well, who told you that? I said, the Bible doesn't say that. It says the love of money is evil. It doesn't say money's evil. Money's necessary to do all kinds of things, and it just takes on the nature of the person who has it. Oh, he thought for a while, and then he said, I know. I know where it came from. He said, when I was seven, my father decided to do business, and he was away all the time, and I could never see him and never had time with him, and I missed him very much. And I, became, I came to the conclusion, money takes away the people you love. I'll never have money. I said, well, you need to break that vow and forgive your dad and let go of the pain so you can now become free to live in a prosperous life as God wants you to. Okay? So we need to explore the roots. You're going to find out what's going on in your heart. Explore the roots. Well, what happened? What happened to me, Holy Spirit? Show me what happened. Show me where this pain is rooted. Show me <clears throat> what happened in my heart. Show me what happened to me. Help me remember what I've been trying to forget. Lord, I'm willing to let go control and let you come in. Before, I didn't have anyone to help me. I just managed it the best I could and saved myself. I'm now asking Jesus to save me in that situation. Bring it back to memory. The Holy Spirit, bring it back up so you can feel the pain. Journaling is a way of writing down and expressing what your heart says and feeling the pain. But we've got to identify what happened. How did it affect me? Some of you are living impacted by events of years ago. And you're living your life out. You're in church, you praise God, but still there's parts of your life lived out of the pain you've never resolved. And the judgments you made and the bitter, bitter things that have got into your heart. But if you let the Holy Spirit in there, you say, that's what happened. I know where you got hurt. I know what's causing this behavior. Will you let me come in? He said, well, I don't want to let you in because I'll feel pain. Yeah, but that's the whole point. You can't get free unless you let the pain come up and bring the pain to the cross like you'd bring any sin to the cross. Hiding sin means we can't be forgiven. Hiding pain means you can't be healed. How about that? So, so we take time, you put worship music on, you sit in this present, do some journaling until you found out what's happened, how it's affected me and let it go. We've got to actually choose to forgive, choose to release the people that hurt us, choose to let it go. And to let it go doesn't mean it's not important, doesn't mean it wasn't a big issue, doesn't mean I'm going to trust them. To let it go means I'm letting go of the big debt that you owe me because you hurt me so deeply. I'm actually claiming my freedom back. I've been carrying and controlled by this pain for all my life. You understand? Until you let it go, it controls you because you live in fear it'll happen again. Now forgive the person. Then maybe there's an area you need to repent. Lord, forgive me for carrying such anger and bitterness for so long. And it's been leaking over to my marriage, to my spouse, to my children. It's been leaking over in my relationships. It's been controlling the way I use people to get what I want. And so this is about living a godly life. This is about taking the heart journey where you let the Holy Spirit heal your heart and build great values inside, where you encounter the love of God and you become free from all this other clutter. And so sometimes it requires deliverance, but almost always uh, you'll find it requires that the demonic defilement has to be removed. Demons come in around those places and they keep you tormented. I had one pastor came to me and he's in his about 52 and at seven he was sexually molested. For all these years he's been tormented. And he came finally, he said, I can't handle it anymore. 
because often when people get in their 50s, they can't handle it. They just can't hold the stuff together anymore. It's just they've held it together all those years. Now they can't hold it. And he came to me. We prayed for him. He forgave the man. We broke the ties to the abuse. The demons left him. And he said, all the voices have gone. The anger has gone. I'm free. His wife could tell he changed. Kids knew he changed. Church knew he changed. Everything had changed. So, so, so things, sometimes we've got to put things right with people. Like I mentioned, I had to go and apologize. To apologize to my wife, apologize to my children, apologize to many people. But that's because when we're broken, we hurt people. And sometimes you just got to get that right and start to say, well, one, of the, one of the first places is to get it right with your parents, whether they're alive or dead deal with the pain and the bitterness, bring it to the cross and forgive and bless and say, God, thank you from where I came from. I'm bringing an end to the cycle and building a new future for the next generation. Who knows if God didn't put you in that family to bring an end to what's been happening and to start something different for the future. Amen. Who knows? Who knows? That's what, they, that's what Joseph was able to say. He said, guys, you meant it for evil, but God meant this for good. He sent me ahead so I could be a salvation to you. So what we've done in our lives, both of us, both of us have taken the journey to face the pain and to bring resolution to the cross and to change what's going on inside so we could build something different for the next generation financially, in marriage, in relationship, in connection, spiritually, in every arena. You could do the same, but it starts with a decision to move on what God spoke to you today about. Thanks for listening. To find out more about our pastors, team, and what we do at C3 San Diego, go to C3SanDiego.com.